Hey, this is Beth. Listen, what we live for at Living Proof is to serve people the Word of God. We base our ministry on Hebrews 4.12 that tells us that the Word is alive and active. We pray this message is going to serve you in some way today and that God is going to speak through it. Thank you so much for giving us this privilege. Lord, your Word says that before we see you face to face, That out of your kindness and your grace and your sovereignty, you would reveal yourself to us. You said to your disciples in John chapter 14, others will not see me, but you will see me. And I believe, Father, that you meant that through the revelation of the Spirit. And, Father, I pray that as you teach us your word, we will see you. No, we cannot see your face and live, but we can see your heart. And God, I come before you, if I've ever asked you for humility in teaching a subject, I ask it today. And I humble myself before you as a simple-minded woman with far more questions than answers. But I thank you that you have given us glimpses and given us truths in your word that we can hang our hat on. And so, Father, I ask you to teach us today. I do not desire to come to them as dogmatic today. I want to suggest what seems to me could be true. I bless you and I praise you. God, how I thank you. What a mess we would be in had you not written it down. If it had just been left to oral tradition, generation after generation, what in the world would your word appear like today? But you made absolutely sure, Father, that it was eternal. And you have kept a safeguard over it, even through translations. You have made sure that your word would speak. We need you to speak to us today. We are listening. Say, I'm listening, Lord. We want to hear from you. We want to know your heart. So we bless you and we praise you and we ask you to fall upon us with a mighty outpouring of your spirit and teach us truth. A truth that will make us humble, not proud. That will make us gentler, not arrogant. We bless you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Ephesians chapter 1. Since we're only getting through verse 6, I can't think of anything better than to just begin with verse 1. Somebody say amen. (laughs) Ephesians 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. Everybody say, by the will of God. (laughs) To the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as I read you verse 3, if you were here last week, this ought to begin putting pictures in your mind. The King James Version says, blessed be. The NIV says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you already have a picture in your mind of what that means because it's a word from which we get our English word, eulogy. It means to speak blessing. And we found that it meant many things last week, but among those things, it means speak blessing over the one who speaks blessing over us. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us. A form of the same root word in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing, same from the same exact root word in Christ. Now, these are our focus scriptures for this morning. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Christ Jesus in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. What wonderful scriptures. So full of encouragement. And as we first look at them, who would guess that they would be the center of such controversy. These verses and so many others that say similar truths as we would find in Ephesians chapter 1. Now I want to tell you something before we ever get started here this morning. Because this is just a burden that God has laid upon my heart for unity in the body. I love the entire body of Christ. I love the body. It is something when we think about a heritage that we want to leave to our children, it's something that I've pounded into the heads of both of my daughters. We, in this family, love the whole body of Christ. 
even parts of the body that we may not necessarily agree on in some interpretations of doctrine. But we love the body of Christ. That is the will of God that we would love one another whether or not we agree with one another on every point of doctrine. So I want to make sure you understand that, that I am committed to unity even where there is vast diversity. And I'll also tell you this based on what I have understood in study and really looking over the body of Christ for the last 20 years. I've really come to the conclusion that most of the time our doctrinal differences are interpretational rather than truth versus heresy. Do you understand what I mean? And it may be an imbalance of what we emphasize in one church to another. Somebody asked me not too long ago if a, if I felt like a particular church that that um, I'm very familiar with uh, was heretical. And I said, absolutely not. Absolutely not. What they're teaching you can find based in Scripture. It just so happens to be that they very often teach that one side without necessarily teaching the other. You understand what I'm saying? That doesn't make it false teaching. That doesn't make it heresy. That may make it imbalanced. But let me tell you, in all our denominations, we tend towards some area of exactly that same practice. We will go to the Word to reconfirm what we already believe. In other words, we read and reread and reread exactly the same things because we want to reconfirm what we already believe. So every single time we walk into a different church, to some degree, we're doing that, tottering, teetering just a little bit, In the area of balance. So most of the time it's not false doctrine versus truth. It is interpretational differences between us. And very often we'll see it in situations just like today. However, this one is highly divisive. You and I are going to talk about election this morning. And I can't think of anything. I can think of maybe one other subject. And that would be the tongues issue that we may see as heated a debate over. But beyond that, I cannot think of anything more than what your stand may be on election. And the heated arguments and the frustration and even sometimes to the point of disrespecting one another over this particular issue is huge. Now, I'm not going to get into five-point Calvinism versus Arminianism. That's not you, you do that. That's not what I'm after this morning. If you want to look into that, you look into that, and, and you'll, you'll be blessed. Get into it. Really study it so you can see what the issues are. But you will find out that they are very, very heated, and people feel strongly about them. And not only that, but you get on both sides of those issues, and you will also find that very few people agree with one another on both sides of the issues. You understand what I'm saying? So they're in disagreement even on this side. They're in disagreement on this side. Very, very divisive. Here is what I do find myself resistant to. And it's the reason why I want to study this with you this morning and take you through these scriptures. I can look at both of those sides and I can find biblical basis. I can look at the five points of of Calvinism, and I can tell you I could go point by point with much of what they're trying to say. And there are some other areas where I'm going to say, but I don't necessarily think that is exactly what that means in that point. You understand what I'm saying? But here is what I do find myself resistant to, and it's what I want to show you in Scripture. What I do object to is the idea, and please understand, it is not held by all who are on this side of the issue. It, it is a small number, as it often is, but it is a very, it's a, it's a loud minority. But there is some kind of prevalent attitude that those who do not take necessarily an extremely hyper Calvinistic view are not well educated in the things of Scripture. That's what I object to. I object to the fact that one of them stands with with uh, believing in the veracity of God's word and that God's word is inerrant and it stands. And the other is just us trying to interpret whatever we want any way we want to. That's not true. You could look on either side of this issue and you could find yourself some sound biblical evidence to support either one of them. That's what I'm trying to say to you. To assume that one holds true to the word of God and the other does not, I hope to disprove that to you this morning. 
Now, what in the world do we do with that? What in the world do we do when we've got concepts in the word of God that appear to contradict one another? The most wonderful word I ever heard on this subject was by John Bazzano. He spoke to this one, Sonny, not necessarily to this subject matter. I don't believe it was on this subject matter, but it was just on times when we look at Scripture and it appears that, that these Scriptures say this and that these Scriptures say that. And I'm not talking about one taken out of context. You can pull Scripture out of context and get it to say anything you want it to say. But I'm talking about when you have weighty evidence on each side and we have got that case this morning. Then we have to ask, what are we to do with that? When it seems that they contradict one another, and yet we know that God will never contradict himself. So it cannot be a contradiction. So Brother John said this to us. So which is right? When you've got two views that seem to oppose one another in what appears to be in biblical doctrine, which is right? And his answer was this, and this is the answer I bring you this morning. Both are right. Both are right. In our human minds, we cannot comprehend how something that seems contradictory to us could possibly both be right. But in the omniscience of God, they are. And we will see it and our minds will be open when we see him face to face and come into all knowledge. He will prove right on everything, even what seems To contradict something else. He will show us how it all pulls together. What is not going to happen this morning is is me giving you a list of scriptures that say that words like all and everyone, which is what I would love to teach you this morning, for God so loved the what? And that everyone and the all-inclusive, anyone who would desire, I'd love to give you a list of that. But see, I know enough about the issue to be able to tell you that people that are on the far other side of that particular concept could then come right back behind me. I could also turn around and give you a scripture for to say the, the highly elective and selective concept on the other side. So we're not even going to bother with that because I'm going to tell you up front, you're going to find them on both sides of that matter. So that's not going to do us any good this morning because let's all agree you have got biblical basis for either one of those. So we're not even going to waste time with that because I promise you both sides are there. Here is what we're going to do. We're going to see what Ephesians 1 has to say. We're going to take it apart a little bit. We're going to look at some other scripture. And in fact, just so we don't begin closing our Bible before we get there, that last list of scriptures in your notes is one of the most important places we got to get. So we're going to go pretty hurriedly through the beginning. My stand has been for a number of years since I read this particular quote by A.W. Tozer. This has been my stand. I quote it many times and I place it out there for you to see because this is where I want to sit on this issue. However, our study of Ephesians chapter 1 forces me to deal with this in one way or another. We are going to be people of God's word. I want to be a woman of God's word. So I'm, I'm not going to overlook it. We're going to tackle it this morning and see what we think. But before we do, I want you to hear this quote. Again, this is A.W. Tozer out of The Pursuit of God. God will not hold us responsible to understand the mysteries of election and predestination and the divine sovereignty. The best and safest way to deal with these truths is to raise our eyes to God and in deepest reverence say, O Lord, Thou knowest. Everybody say that with me. O Lord, Thou knowest. Those things belong to the deep and mysterious profound of God's omniscience. This is my very favorite part, I think, of the quote. Prying into them may make us theologians, but it will never make us saints. May make us theologians, but it will not make us saints. You and I want to be true saints of the body. That love the entire body of Christ and do not get into matters of pointless debate. Not all debate is pointless. But by the time we're just stacking up scriptures when this side's got them and this side's got them and we're shooting it like machine guns at one another, something is wrong. Something's wrong. So let's take a look. I want to go back and read verses 
4 through 6 again. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world. I want you to catch that. Don't miss that phrase. Before he ever said, let there be light, he had already said, let there be Sarah. You understand what I'm saying? Let there be Donald. Let there be Walter. Let there be John. Let there be Mary Ann. He already knew in his knowledge of what was to come, how he would lay out every single generation, how it was going to go. And he ordained it before the very creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love. Everybody say in love. He predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Okay, we got some catch words there that we got to go with here. The first one is chose for he chose us. Look at that word chose. You see it in the Greek language and it means exactly what you think it does. We can't make another thing out of it. It means to choose, select. Choose for oneself. In fact, when I looked at the Amplified Version, if you're familiar with the Amplified, it is a wonderful, wonderful Bible, particularly to study. Because what they have attempted to do in that particular translation is take the original language, determine what they believe that word is trying to say in a wider, a broader understanding than our simpler English words would do it in the King James Version or NIV, and they're inserting it into the passage. So I want to read it to you out of the Amplified Version. It says, even as in his love he chose us, actually picked us out for himself as his own. In Christ before the foundation of the world. Listen to that again. He actually picked us out for himself as his own. That's pretty powerful stuff. Before the creation of the world. Knowing everything about us, picturing our face, knowing exactly where he would plant us in generation and parts of the world, that is pretty amazing. Then the other word, and of course this is the big one, he predestined us. I think we could do, still deal with, with chose okay. But then we get into this word, and this is when we gotta come up with something here. Alright, this, this says what it says. Would everybody agree? It, it says, Predestined. As we look at that word, you can see it in the Greek, P-R-O-O-R-I-Z-O. That P-R-O, you can already see, is beforehand. The rest of that word means to determine or decree. So it means to determine or decree beforehand. Preordain. Predestinate. Now, before we start matching up scriptures... And take it topically to other places. Let's look in our context and see what we can learn already about predestination in our context. You look at the verse that says it. You will find it in verse 5. He predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ. And you will look on both sides of that as it says. In accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace. I want you to look on each side of that statement. A predestination. It begins with in love and it ends with grace. So I don't think we can begin to comprehend anything about predestination unless we understand that that doctrine is sandwiched between two critical determinations. And that is love and grace. Love and grace. Every time we think the word predestination, we ought to immediately bring up an association of love and grace. Because you see it very, very perfectly placed between those two doctrines. In other words, we were supposed to have understood predestination in terms and in reference to love. Not not somehow of some strange sort of inverted meanness or prejudice toward those who are not. And that's how we've twisted that thing around. We can't look at predestination without looking at love. There is a, the Bible's, uh, pardon me, the Expositor's Bible commentary says this about love. And I just loved it. I'm pulling this out. For you this morning, it says, any interpretation of this mysterious doctrine that detracts from the love of God is rightly suspect. In other words, you, you even discuss it apart from the love of God and you've already made your interpretation of it rightly suspect. Its positive intention is underlined here. That's what the expositor's Bible commentary says. You can't view it without viewing it in love. Can't even talk about it without talking about it in love. 
And then it's sandwiched on the other side. That other side of it is grace. So here's what I'm going to tell you. I don't know how this whole thing works. I won't be able to explain to you how it was that we were chosen before the very foundation of the world. But I'll tell you this. It has to do with a loving God. And I'll tell you this. It is all about grace. It is not about who deserved it. So there is nothing in it to boast about. There is no grounds whatsoever for arrogance. It is totally out of place. Because what we're hearing here is that it cannot be separated from the doctrine of grace. Now, I've just pitched out this question to you this morning. So what in the world is the possible basis for this choosing or what is properly called election? We're going to see that word in just a minute. We're going to see elect. What's the basis for that? I want to pitch a couple of things out to you. Number one is this, and we know that this is absolutely true. Number one is the sovereignty of God. We could just say that and we could all go home. Amen? Because God is sovereign. Our God is in the heavens and he hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. That's just it. He is sovereign. But that leaves us as human beings with the spirit of God in us a little bit uncomfortable about what does that mean Would it please him then for there to be many and masses of people that will never know him and never know him other than his wrath? Woo! So in our human thinking, that's where we begin to go with that. But the answer to this question is totally, and he does not owe us any explanation whatsoever. He is sovereign. The sovereignty of God. Number two, still, what is the possible basis for this choosing or what is popularly called election? We have absolutely no idea. Amen. Let's just all of us write it down. All of us write it down because that's it in a nutshell. When it all comes down, we do not know. We do not know. And anybody acting like they absolutely and positively do is delving into the mysterious of God where they have no, no thought to be. There's a wonderful scripture in the Psalms that says that I will not have myself, and I'm paraphrasing here, all caught up in things that are too wonderful for me to know. That there are some things that are just beyond us. And this is one of those things. Number three is this. Again, among the possible basis for this choosing or what is popularly called election, the implications of Matthew 22. We're going to talk about Matthew 22, 1 through 14. So I'll have you turn with me there. Let's give this some consideration. When I see Paul inspired of God in his writing of Scripture, and I see Peter, and I see James, and I see John, and I'm studying those things, and I'm unclear about some of those doctrines, one of the questions I'm going to ask myself in study is, what did Jesus say about it? Did he specifically point out anything about it? I'm going to go, want to go look at that. That doesn't mean that Paul and Peter's writings and John and this, that's inspired scripture. That is God breathed. It just means I want to hear it then as best I can. Are there teachings of Christ that would tell me about that? Because often in a lot of ways, he would speak in language, in parables and in situations that, that sometimes our minds can then comprehend and picture. This is one of those times. Matthew 22, I'm going to begin Reading at verse 1 through 14, Jesus spoke to them again in parables saying, the kingdom of heaven is like. So we already know we're about to see something that is going to help us understand the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field and another to his business. Now, already we're seeing two kinds of people. In verse 3, when it says they refuse to come, I'm seeing the kind of person that absolutely just has heard the invitation of the gospel, and they just absolutely refuse it. They refuse it. I've got a loved one that feels exactly that way. He knows he has heard the gospel. He has made a very open-minded decision 
to refuse it. In fact, he said to me, and this is someone I love very much, I would rather go to hell than it be true. Woo! Okay. All righty then. Amen. Okay. That is refusing to come. That is refusing to come. Open refusal. But then that next one in verse 5, but they paid no attention to it and went off, one to his field, another to his business. What is that? Too busy to even think about it. We have masses of people that fall under that category. Many that just simply are too busy, are not even giving any thought to it. Masses of people that fall under that category. They paid no attention to it whatsoever. Now, verse 6, the rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready. But those I invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. I want everybody to repeat that phrase with me. Anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad. It is of critical importance that we repeat that phrase right there. Say it with me. Whether good or bad, understand with me that that's telling us whatever's going to happen here is all about grace. Because whoever's coming to this, whether, whether they were good or bad, that's not going to be the basis. How they have lived their past life is not going to be the basis as to whether or not they are led in this wedding banquet. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Anyone you find, both good or bad, bring it on. And it says, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. Verse 11. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 14, this is so important. For many are invited, but few are chosen. Many are invited, but few are chosen. All right, that's our buzzword this morning. For he chose us in him. If we looked at chosen here and we saw chose, we would find that they can't come from the same word in the Greek. We would just find that, of course, he chose us is the verb form of it. But they come from the same. So we're talking about the same general thing here. Now, who was chosen? I ask you, I wish we could take 10 minutes and everybody could just sit there with their Bibles open. And I would ask you to read those passages carefully and then tell me, so who were the chosen ones? Because we say this verse and quote this verse all the time. For many are invited, but few are chosen. And I beg you to look at the context of who was chosen. He said, I've made lots of invitations. Some people refuse to come. Other people were too busy to come. So here's what I'm going to tell you. You go out, you give this to anyone you can find, both good or bad. Now, they had to come in on a certain basis because when they were in there, they were all in the banqueting hall. They were all here at the wedding supper. But there was a man who was not wearing wedding clothes. What on earth does that mean? Turn with me, if you would, please, to Isaiah. Chapter 61, verse 10. We are going to find this verse in the context of a wedding. So that's perfect for us to relate together. It says in Isaiah 61, verse 10, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. Now look at that because it's talking about God having clothed us. I believe this is the wedding clothes that he's talking about in Matthew chapter 22. These are the garments of salvation and they are the robe of righteousness. In other words, what I believe he's saying, now look back at Matthew chapter 22. What I believe he's saying is this. Anyone you find, both good and bad, bring them into the banquet. 
But this is the condition. They must come based on my requirement instead of their own. In other words, they're going to come on my terms and not their own. What is the term? we got to put on Christ. Christ is the only way. Being wrapped in the garments of salvation and the robes of righteousness through Jesus Christ is the only way we're getting into that banquet. But anyone... I believe what Matthew 22 is saying, and please, please help me here if you don't see this. Anyone you find, both good and bad, but here is the condition. They will come in the garments of salvation and in the robes of righteousness. That will be the covering. In other words, they will be covered by Jesus Christ. There's one way we're getting in, and that is through Jesus Christ. That is completely consistent with Scripture. But I want you to go back to that word. So, many are called, but few are chosen. Now, wait a second here. Who was chosen? Who was chosen? Hmm? Was it, does it not appear from Matthew chapter 22 that those were chosen who chose to come on the conditions that were required of them? I, I'm just pitching that out to you. I want you to study it and see if it is so. Because what I want to at least have you thinking about here and brought in your mind to see is based on this parable, consider the very elementary possibility. And I know for some of my more scholarly friends that I love very much and have a great respect for, this is too elementary for them. But I'm still going to tell you, I read this and I read this and I read this. And this is what I come back to over and over again. The elementary possibility that God reserves the sovereign right to choose those who will choose him. Is that not who was chosen in Matthew 22? Many are called, but few are chosen. Who was chosen? Those who came, both good and bad, on his terms and not their own. They chose to come on those terms. The invitation went out to many who did not receive the invitation. So that makes us wonder about efficacious. In other words, that, that, that everyone to whom the invitation goes out has automatically got to respond to it. Hmm. I just, I'm just saying, open your mind. I don't know. I'm just pitching, I just want you to understand that you don't have to be uneducated to believe this could be true. Do you hear what I'm trying to say to you? We can be educated people in the Word of God and still think this could be true. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't say we don't know our scriptures. It doesn't say we don't have a list of theological degrees. We can honestly look with an intelligent mind at the scriptures and say that could be. That could be. It is what it could imply there. Now, here's where we go to the other side of this. See, we could stop right here and we could still all be happy. Amen, because we're chosen. Glory to God. We can know we're we're in here. The fact that you have a desire to pursue God. Most of you in this room consider Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. We're good. We're good. But there's another side to this. And what I want to point out to you, I'm going to do it. We're going to turn to Romans 9. Because we're going to be fair, as fair as we can. Here's the problem. These are very good chapters for you to study and read on your own. You really want to get into this. Uh... Romans 9 through 11, boy, that's the hot spot. That's the hot spot. So by all means, get in there and study the thing. But I've got to pull one verse out of it, but you can know it is in complete context. In fact, I'll just, so that we can see, we'll just back up to 21. Uh, Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for noble purposes and some for common use? Verse 22, what if God, now I love the fact, and I, I praise God for the fact that it's put to us as a question. What if God, choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? Okay, here we go. Because here's the problematic issue. It's the other side of election for salvation and is the implication of election for wrath. Hear what I'm saying to you. 
This is where the big, this is the biggest hot spot we've got on this issue. Is are we saying, and is that the implication of what is being said in Romans chapter 9, that yes, there is the mystery of, of the election for salvation, but alongside that is the mystery of election for wrath. Woo! I mean, that is big. That is big. Now, I'm going to tell you the reason why I have not just debated this and debated this, and I've not had a big problem with it in my own personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, is because I have a whole lot more I need to know about him, and it is my pursuit to know the wonders of his person. But I'll tell you this, I know him well enough for this not to trouble me to death. Because I can't always explain what he might do. But Scripture invites me to know who he is. And in knowing who he is and knowing the mercy he's had on my life, I, mean, I make the least sense of anybody I know. That is why I'm not just up in arms over it personally. This does not trouble me personally because I trust the heart of God. He does not look on the outward appearance of things. He looks upon the heart. And I trust the heart that looks upon the heart. Where I get into it is where it becomes a body issue. That's a different matter. I don't have a problem with God over the issue. I have a problem with seeing this much divisiveness in the body of Christ over it. That's where it becomes very troublesome to me. I want you to hear this. Remember when I was talking about the Amplified and how it is built, what the attempt of the Amplified version is. I want you to hear the Amplified on Romans 9.22 because it says it differently. What if God, although fully intending to show the awfulness of his wrath, and I, I understand uh, God's need and desire to show his holiness through his wrath. That does not trouble me. Fully intending to show the awfulness of his wrath and to make known his power and authority has tolerated with much patience the vessels, objects of his anger, which are ripe for destruction. Hmm. Now, that says something to me a little bit differently than are necessarily elected and chosen for destruction. You understanding what I'm saying? I just want to pitch that out to you. Now, here is where I think this thing marries together. This is where I think I've been told many, many times, you've got to be on one side of this or the other. There is nothing in between. But I will go back to what Brother John says every single time. When all is said and done and we see the face of God and we come into all knowledge somehow, some way, it's all going to have been right. It's all go- that scripture in concepts that big, neither one of these sides are small. They're not taking a scripture here and a scripture there. They got plentiful scriptures on both sides of this matter. So somehow or another, this is all coming together, and God is going to prove how it's going to show itself right and how he will show himself right in this matter because he is sovereign and he is at the same time love and grace. What I want to pitch out to you and then try to show you in Scripture the possibility is this. A possible explanation of those chosen for salvation versus those that seem to be chosen for wrath, I believe, is wrapped up in the fact that God's sovereignty cannot be separated from his foreknowledge. God's sovereignty cannot be separated from his foreknowledge. In other words, I believe that every single time you make the statement or I make the statement that God is sovereign, we cannot make that apart from the fact that in his sovereignty he is completely all-knowing and foreknowing. How in the world otherwise did he choose us in him before the foundation of the world? Knowing everything about us. I tell you, you cannot know what comfort that has been to me in my sin. Because I know if God knew me enough to bring me up to my salvation and had a calling on my life up to that point, he also had to see it all the way through to the very end. And he knew how I would disappoint myself and sin against him. And how he would go to great lengths to bring me home to his heart and to teach my unhealthy legs, how to walk between those ditches. I praise God for that. I want to show you these scriptures. Glory to God. We are right on time. Go with me. That in itself, God is with us. That in itself is a miracle of God. Is everybody staying with me this morning? By that, I don't mean you have to agree. Because again, this is a very interpretational issue in many ways. Uh, 
You go when you study this thing and see if it is so. What I'm attempting to present to you, though, is that you don't have to be ignorant of Scripture to believe the possibility of this. And that is what some of the implication of attitude is out there. That is what I object to. That we could be knowledgeable people in the Word of God and be on either side of this issue. 1 Peter 1, 2. Now, what statement have I just pitched out to you as what I believe will be the marrying of these concepts together. This is it. God's sovereignty cannot be separated from his foreknowledge. Look at 1 Peter 1, verse 2. If we were to keep it right there in and 1, it would say, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect. Everybody say God's elect. God's elect. Strangers in the world scattered through Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, he's already told us he's he's... Directing this to the elect. So we got a big word there. That's an important word in scripture. So he's going to now describe the elect. To God's elect, comma, he's told us who they are. And now he's going to describe them in verse 2. Who have been what? According to what? You see it? Who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Okay, he said, you are the elect. And he said, you have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. This is what I'm trying to pitch out to you. Is it possible that God chooses who he knows, having seen all generations from beginning to end, is it possible, having seen it all, knowing exactly, not making us necessarily be destined for wrath? You understand what I'm saying? But he knows He knows exactly whether or not we are going to choose to come to him based on his condition, which is we will be uh, wrapped in the robe of righteousness and garments of salvation through Christ Jesus and Christ Jesus alone. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and that's just it. That's just it. Now, as we look at that, see it again. Who've been chosen, and then there's foreknowledge. Yes, chosen. Well, we have not been chosen apart from foreknowledge. So he knew in advance what he was choosing. I don't know if that's important to you, but it's important to me. Because it also tells me what is not chosen. There was a foreknowledge about what was not being chosen. Does that help anybody but me? Boy, that helps me. That helps me to know. Because it is going to be everything I can do for the rest of my days. I will pray for that loved one of mine to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But when all is said and done, if he dies before me, and I, and I believe in my heart, he died lost, then there will be some comfort in me knowing that was the way it was. It just was the way it was. And God knew that would be his decision before he ever birthed him on the face of this earth. So, 1 Peter 1, 2, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. All right, Romans 8. We're going to verse 29, but wouldn't it be a shame not to read 28? (laughs) This is what gets me into time trouble. Amen. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. Praise him. Verse 29. Now look for our buzzwords here. For those God foreknew, he also what? Those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called, dot, dot, dot. Look at that. How does it begin? Where does the choice begin? When it says then he predestined them, what are we told happens I'm not going to say before because it's not a time thing. But what is undergirding predestination? Foreknowledge. Foreknowledge undergirds predestination. Those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. And those he predestined, he also called. Now, I don't know if you think that's huge, but to me, I think that's big. To me, that settles a whole lot of things in my heart. It doesn't answer every question we've got. We could stand, you know, the thing about it, I'm not going to get letters from you, but boy, am I going to get them when this gets out there. Because, you know, we could argue this one till the cows come home. All I'm presenting to you is, do we have to be considered ignorant of Scripture to think this is possible? 
That's all I'm asking this morning. Okay, now go with me to Romans chapter 11. I want to read verses 1 through 6. Romans 11. Okay, we were talking about objects of wrath, objects for salvation, objects for wrath a moment ago. In the context of the primary thing it's talking about here, we're going to see uh, is Israel. And boy, I'm going to stand. God knows exactly what he's doing with Israel. It is, I am of the opinion, uh, it, is, it is my opinion based on my understanding of the word of God that those people, he has got his plan going. He knows what he is doing. And I believe it's clear here. I do not believe we have replaced them. I believe we are grafted in to the true Israel. Uh, he, we have not replaced them. And that's important to me because I love the Hebrew people and I love that plan of God regarding those people. Romans 11 verse 1. I asked then, did God reject his people? By no means. I'm an Israelite myself. A descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. This is Paul uh, talking. God did not reject his people whom he what? There we go. Whom he foreknew. Don't you know that scripture says in the passage about Elijah how he appealed to God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I'm the only one left and they are trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? And now he's quoting how God answered him. I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. Now notice with me that this remnant is chosen by grace. Now he's drawing the parallel to these people who did not bow the knee to Baal. It does not mean they deserved to be part of the remnant of God. For by grace we have been saved through faith, not by our own works. For all fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned. And fallen short of the glory of God. So it's absolutely and unequivocally. I can't even say it. So I'm not even going to try. (laughs) Undoubtedly, it is a work of grace. Hallelujah. It says then in verse 6. And if by grace, then it is no longer works. If it were grace, um, if it were, grace would no longer be grace. Now, here's what I want you to understand that he's saying to us. He's saying that that remnant... When he said, I have reserved this many, he's making this kind of parallel. And yet he's saying that that remnant chose not to serve Baal. But they, their choice was God. Do you understand? And because they did not bow the knee to Baal, they were reserved. And because of the grace of God, they gave them the grace not to bow to Baal. Do you understand how it's always going to go uh, in a circle? The grace to obey has got to come from God. The grace to even choose has got to come from God. And that's where it goes in, back into that hyper-electionism. Can I explain that? No. No. I can't. But God can. And one day we'll learn. And isn't it going to be fun in heaven when we look around and go, you got here. Who would have believed it? Amen. All right. Now look at Romans 11. Uh, Further in the chapter, and what God has done for us by holding the clock for us is that he's given me time. I wanted so much to start our reading at 25 instead of 33, and God's going to allow us to do that time-wise. So Romans 11, same chapter. Now we're going to drop down to verse 25. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. Everybody say, so that we may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. Do you see what that says? Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies on your account. Now listen, because that's, that's very important. In other words, we are not to take up their gospel. We are to love the true Israel. We are to pray for Jerusalem. We are to be a friend to the Jew. But what he is saying here is, you need to understand something. You don't go taking up their gospel. You got the gospel of Jesus Christ, the already have come king. Okay? So he's, he's saying very carefully here, their enemies on, on the account, um, on, 
As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies on your account. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gift and his call are irrevocable. I don't know if anybody wants to amen that but me. But I tell you what, I could amen that. Verse 30. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience. Would you look at that? So they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. Verse 32, this is huge. For God has bound all men over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them. How many? For God has bound all men over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. It does not mean we can just sin like we want to. You know better than that. I know better than that. We're just looking at this scripture that tells us that obviously there are things beyond our comprehension. What I can tell you is this. He has got a plan. It is very, very intricate. It was well thought out before the creation of the world. That's why Revelation calls Christ the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. Because before he ever said, let there be light, he had to look at his son and go, are you sure you're in? Because once I breathe a soul into this first man, they're going to be in trouble very soon after that. They will fail us. They will be disobedient. We will see rebellion. So we may as well not bother with creating the first one if you are not totally committed to being the lamb slain. It's of critical importance. So hard for us to understand, but the plan is not only going, but we need the comfort of knowing this morning it is going well. It is going well. Now, here's what we say. We get down to verse 33, and Paul said it so well, which is why I find it surprising in, our, in today's religious culture that we will be so dogmatic. Because Paul himself would not go there. Paul himself was too scared to go there. That's what A.W. Tozer was saying. I'm too scared to go there. What he's suggesting to the rest of us is we would be wise to be too scared to go there. And what we'd be wise to come up with, and he's still under the inspiration of the Spirit, as he says, and you can just sense him just looking straight up into the heavenlies, as Paul says, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Amen. You hear what he's saying? Who can figure this out? So he's under the inspiration of the scripture. And I love this because I've always wondered how it felt. So here Paul is writing under the inspiration of Scripture. And many times he had somebody else that was pinning it for him as he was dictating it. But can't you imagine as passionate as he was that when he wrote it himself, that he tore the papyrus while he wrote it out of his passion. Can you just almost imagine how he must have written it? So he's writing all this down. And I believe maybe as he's seeing it come out of his pen under the inspiration and filling of the Holy Spirit, that as he's seeing it, he's thinking, I don't get it. But this is what I'm hearing. This is what is coming to me. This is what the Spirit of God is saying to me. And so the end of it is, he is basically saying this, do you want me to explain it? I cannot. I cannot. Because he said, what I believe he's implying to us is already we've got questions going, well, how can that be if so-and-so is true? And Paul is going, you think I know? I'm telling you, he says, oh, the depths of his riches, of the wisdom and knowledge of God, How unsearchable his judgments. This I know. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And oh, how I pray as one who has been in such need of grace. That we have not somehow missed it to boil it down to a simple truth of that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Would you pray with me? God, we confess to you that we do not have these answers. But I want to tell you, Lord, what is my comfort. And this I've tried to infer to this class, however poorly I know this. You are God who loves. You are God who created man in order to fellowship with him. And you are God 
who can be trusted. You are all wise. You are all knowing. And yes, you are sovereign. And I don't believe your sovereignty can be separated from your foreknowledge. Those you foreknew, you also did predestinate. Help us, God. We want to know you. But even when we cannot understand, God, make us humble servants, a people of unity in the body who love and respect one another. In the mighty and precious name of Jesus, amen. Thanks for listening. This podcast is sponsored by Living Proof and Beth Moore.